quick content and spoiler warning for Fear and Hunger. We do talk about some endgame plot points and bosses. Also, we'll be talking about a few icky and nasty things that we can find in the game. But of course, you clicked on this so you know what you're getting into. I hope. A marriage. In the world of Fear and Hunger, a marriage occurs when two willing participants use the show love option on the ritual circle to honor the god of creation, Sylvian. Through the ritual, the two participants will be joined in the flesh and become one, creating a new entity, a mix of the two called a marriage. A marriage appears as a deformed humanoid that seems to have parts of the two combined. The in-game sprite clearly shows a difference in the left and right of the marriage. We can see that one of the arms is a lot longer and thicker. And there are even darker variants on this that we encountered in the gauntlet with the moonless guards, which are a marriage between a prison guard and a moonless cave dog. And I think that's all I really need to know about that. There is even a nastier variant on the marriage called an abominable marriage. If someone that has already performed a marriage tries to perform one again, merging with a third person or creature, it would lead to this abominable marriage, which is a merger of three different entities in a frame that cannot hold it and being an affront to nature and the human form. While some may want to pursue this option to get greater physical strength and improve their chances in survival in the dungeon, you have to ask the question, is it worth it to give up your human form to become this deformed parody of the human form? The Devour Ability. The Devour Ability is an ability that, oh, I'm going to mispronounce this, Ragvaldar, Rag, Rag, I'll just leave it at that can inherit from his warrior culture in Odengard, giving him an advantage in the dungeon. The Devour ability allows you to consume the body of your fallen enemies after defeating them in battle. In the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger, where food is scarce, having an extra food source is an extremely useful ability. The only real downside is that you have to be careful with what you eat. More natural types of enemies, like the prison guards are safe to eat, but some of the later enemies like the Mumbler, Lord of Flies, White Angel could be poisonous or toxic. There is no greater way to demonstrate victory over an enemy than to eat your enemies. But considering all the other things that would be seen in the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger, devouring your enemies, I guess, really isn't that bad, all things considered. The Wolf Mask Orgy. Down in the mines, the protagonist of our story, going deeper into the dungeon, might hear moaning and groaning coming down from a deeper section of the mine. Descending, you can see the wolf mask ritual, which will probably have to be censored due to YouTube's monetization policies. Encountering the wolf mask, we can see and discuss what is this ritual to honor Grogoroth. As the participants eat each other and themselves while still awake and alive, mesmerized in a trance-like state. It's hard to tell if the participants are doing this willingly or under some sort of spell or mind control state. The player will have an option to join the wolf mask ritual once without risk of being lost in the trance. Doing this will fill up the hunger meters for all members of the party, but doing it more than one time will require a coin flip in order for the player character to be able to break out of the trance and leave. Otherwise, the implication is that the player character would be stuck in the orgy until he perishes from the injury sustained. Fear and Hunger very cleverly uses what I call an after-death scene. After fighting some characters, if the player loses, you will be treated to an additional scene that doesn't really impact gameplay, but just acts as flavor text, just to give some more flavor to the enemies and the world of Fear and Hunger. Usually these are pretty brutal and disturbing scenes. If early in the game, on the first floors of the dungeon, if the player falls in combat to torturer, the torturer, the deformed torturer of the dungeon on the second floor, we will be treated to a particularly sadistic after death scene. We will see the player character 
bound as a torturer, goes around and one by one dismembers the player character, taking a particularly evil and nasty delight in doing so. On the topic of disturbing after-death scenes, if the player dies to an elite guard, there is a chance of triggering a scene where the player character will wake up in a locked room with the elite guard uh, with both their legs dismembered. You can try to get away, but once you get to either of the two doors, you find out that they're locked. So the implication here is that the elite guard wanted to play with you and chase you around before bashing your head in. All right, next on our list is the guard's phalluses or the stingers, peepees. The exposed phalluses in the game are used to make the player feel uncomfortable. It's not the type of imagery you would usually see in most run-of-the-mill RPGs or video games. So their presence might make some players feel off balance or off put. Making you wonder what else is there to come, is there anything else unexpected that the game will throw at you? Their design is comically large and long, almost to the point of making it funny. I mean, looking at the character design for the guards, you would think that the stingers would get in the way of running or being a trip hazard. I mean, how do the guards run? Does it just slap against their knees the entire time? Also, another detail that always got to me is how the elite guard is armored and his armor has a section for his phallus. I'm not going to try to show you that in this video, but I am sure you are capable in your Google skills to find a picture on the internet. I've just never seen armor used that way. Pocket Cat. At first glance, there's nothing particularly off-putting about this character. When you first see him in the caverns, he comes off as a well-dressed man with a kind of weird mask, but nothing particularly disturbing past that. What is off-putting is one, his demeanor, and two, his intentions. When it comes to his demeanor, the way that he talks is completely unique in the game and different and seemingly divorced from the setting that you're in. He talks in a Victorian and almost cheerful manner, as if completely oblivious to all the horrors of the dungeon around you. The uniqueness of his vocabulary just makes him seem more otherworldly. But where he really gets disturbing is in his intentions. His goal is to collect children and he's happy to trade from his stockpile of books and claymores for any children. That by itself is disturbing and unnerving. But what takes it a step further is that if you actually complete the trade with him, he starts doing this hand movement in his pocket, which, well, you can see it on screen. I don't really need to elaborate more on that. It just gets under my skin on a very primordial level. Moving on. The Human Hydra. A very popular early game monster you encounter a further perversion of the marriage ritual that we had talked about earlier in the video. But rather than involving two or three people, the human hydra is a marriage of a large group of people. Presumably, having been driven insane or to desperation by the corruption of the cube of the depths, the hydra is believed to be composed by a large number of the dungeon's former guards. What makes it worse is that it only desires one thing, a human child. And if you feed it one, it will comment on how tasty it is. Yum. The Harvest Man. Ah, the Harvest Man. A great example of body horror in video games. His design is uncomfortable. He has distorted dimensions and extra limb, and a head that looks comparatively normal to the rest of his body with a very creepy smile. Why is he smiling? Sometimes in combat, he won't even attack on his turn, but rather, he will just pet somebody very gently on their head. Kind of like he sees you as a pet, a collectible, something cute, or he's amused by you. But as if that wasn't bad enough, there's the question of what is it that the Harvest Man harvests? He's not called that for no reason. There is something that he must be roaming Wahab, 
collecting or harvesting. And we get a glimpse of that from the after death scene if the player falls to a harvest man. Here we can see the harvest man putting his many hands to good use. I'm not going to describe anything else because you can see it on screen and yeah, you don't need me to say anything. Self-dismemberment. Now, this is something that's going to instinctually unnerve anybody. Fear and hunger likes to push you into desperate situations and force you to think your way out. More than once, I've ended up taking a hit that gets one of my party members an infected limb or stepped on one of those fucking rusty nails. Since the game drops are RNG dependent, you might get very few herb drops. There are a few guaranteed green herbs that spawn on the very early levels and then again in the modern version of Mahabra at the end game. So that means with some bad luck, you might end up in a situation where you might be getting infected limbs, but without enough green herbs to cure the infections, leaving you with one last remedy, amputation. A decision not taken lightly, but there are times when it does become the most viable option, especially if the limb in question is a leg from one of your party members. Since losing a leg from a character that's not your main character won't affect your overworld travel speed, sometimes the best thing you can do is whip out the old bone saw to take care of an infection. The other case is when someone that is only using a single-handed weapon gets an infected arm. You might reach the conclusion that it's better to amputate rather than reload the game or lose the character to the infection, but doing so will prevent your character from being able to hold dual-handed weapons or shields. But some characters can't do that anyway. In my playthrough, where I beat the god of fear and hunger for the first time, I had to use the bone saw on the little girl to keep her alive. Since she doesn't really attack too much and can't hold a shield or dual handed weapon, there wasn't an immediate loss for my party. Besides, she wouldn't need the arm once we got to the bottom of the dungeon. Rotten meat and the maggot running up your arm. Something I thought that was cool about fear and hunger is how at first you are presented with an item that appears to be useless, rotten meat. But once you play a bit more, you realize there is a very real and practical use for carrying rotten meat, which is to recruit Moonless early in the game. Her multiple attacks per turn and having another party member in the early game can be a huge help in navigating the dungeon. So that means that the player is incentivized to collect rotten meat in the early stages of the dungeon for use in the caverns. That means that each time you play the game and want to recruit Moonless, you have to collect rotten meat and get the message that plays every time about a maggot running up your arm. The first time I read this, I was left wondering if the maggot would come back and affect my character later on in the game, but it never does, it's just flavor text. The developer of the game decided that the game would make you think of a maggot running up your arm every time you picked up a piece of rotten meat, just to burn that image of a maggot running up your arm into your mind. So no, no thank you, no maggots for me. Well. Unless I'm recruiting Moonless, that is. Next on our list, the Human Husk. If Nazra is in your party when you arrive at Mahabre, he'll mention that he knows these streets and alleyways very well, and that underneath the city, you'll find his secret laboratory. Like Valte, he'd been researching how to create artificial life. Dropping rocks in modern Mahabre and listening for their sound, or lack of, you are able to find the secret entrance to his lab. In his lab, you will find a prototype life imitation machine. By feeding it some of your blood, you are able to manufacture a human husk of yourself. A human husk is physically like a person, but dead or empty on the inside. They are able to drift around aimlessly, but have no conscience or thought. They are just empty husk of a human. Looking into the eyes of a human husk you would notice the complete lack of thought or presence in them. But as simple as a human husk may appear, they do serve a very specific function in the Tower of Torment, where Chambara, the tormented one, roams. Next on our list, Chambara and the Tower of Torment. Investigating the Tower of Torment, the player will very quickly find a machine that is meant to hoist up a person on two mechanical hooks connected to two different winces. It is a machine meant for sacrificing somebody to bring the tower back to life. Here, you have the choice of sacrificing a party member, or if you visited Nazra's secret lab, 
You can also sacrifice the human husk you created and not have to lose anybody in your party. After hoisting the human husk up on the sacrificial machine, the player will have their first encounter with Shambhara, the tormented one. Even looking at him makes me feel uncomfortable. You can tell of his suffering since he lacks skin, nose, and ears. His eyes, like the human husk, are empty black portals. No evidence of the poet that was originally Shambhara is still outwardly visible anymore. He's a strong and dangerous enemy that is happy to beat your party with his fist. Sacrificing the human husk and tearing it apart will reactivate the tower and let the rivers of blood start flowing again. Attempting to leave the Tower of Torment, the player will have to cross this large pool of blood. In approaching it, the player will have a second encounter with Shambara, where he rises out of the pool of blood in a protective ring machine with three outer layers that are spinning around and able to crush anybody that gets close to it. After doing combat with him, he will recede into the pool of blood and you will get the soul of the tormented. When we ask the new gods about the tormented one, they tell us, also known as Ron Shambara, when he was still walking among men as a mere mortal. Once a poet, he believes no great art can be achieved without pain and suffering. He now continues the same principles as a new god. From the wiki, Ron Shambara was once a mortal poet who believed that great art could only be born out of pain and suffering. Upon entering Mahabra, the fellowship became the new gods, with Ron taking the role of the tormented one. He transformed into a skinless being with chains that inflict unending torture upon him for hundreds of years. In turn, he extended his pain and suffering to other creatures within the shrines of Mahabra including the red man which leads us to the next item on our list the red man he who suffered the torture of the tormented one for hundreds of years with every passing year its pain grows stronger the new gods when asked about the red man the red men have been tortured for hundreds of years by ron shambara the tormented one they can be found crawling and wandering the empty halls of the temple of torment in mahabra and a second one can be found in the Tomb of the Gods in the past timeline. Their design resembles Chambara in that they appear to be a flayed man with his skin removed. We find them chained up looking miserable and sad, simply sitting there accepting their fate. But more than anything else, their screeches are blood curdling and can be heard echoing through the halls of torment. They are truly one of the most pitiful creatures we will encounter in the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger. Next, the Penance Armor. The in-game book titled Penance Knights reads, The Penance Knights are a special unit of the Vatican City that wear tailor-made armors. The Penance Knights are used in the most perilous task and missions where the chances of survival are especially low. Thus, the armor has been designed only to be put on. There is no removing it once one is chosen for the mission. The armor has rows of small spikes that drill into the skin of its wearer. The pain is meant to cleanse the mind for a task at hand and also heighten the fury in the midst of combat. Because of the nature of the penance knights and the penance armor, only convicts with life and death sentences are recruited to the unit. The recruits are given one last chance to repent their crimes and atone their sins before the ascended one, Almer, passes on the final judgment. The penance armor can be said to be one of the better armors in the game with some very strong advantages but also weaknesses. The main one is that it will constantly inflict the bleed status effect. That's why it's recommended to equip the Ring of Still Blood before climbing into the armor. Found on the floor where Torturer is, it is a disturbing piece of lore that is very fitting and in keeping of what we know about the Dark Vatican that exists in the universe of fear and hunger. Once a poor victim steps in into the penance armor, they will never step out. It is a one-way trip. There is no surviving the armor once its spikes have clawed its way into your body. And each step causes agonizing pain to the wearer. The Maneba. Although the Maneba is a fairly low level enemy that won't pose much of a threat to an experienced player, there are still a couple of things about this creature that I find unnerving or disturbing. The Maneba has two ways of getting into you. One, telepathically into your thoughts, and one by the injection. 
The Maneba is a telepathic creature spawned by Rare and is able to glimpse inside your mind and communicate directly with you. This is unnerving because this creature is not natural of this world and is able to unsettle the player with its strange and ethereal thoughts that do not belong on this plane of existence. The second more direct way that the Maneba can impact the player is through the inject skill, which gives me shivers because it is able to inject worms into you. And nobody likes the thought of being injected with worms. The worms will increase the rate at which hunger accumulates in the player on top of the effects the dungeon has already been having on the player. It doesn't have a great effect in gameplay, but just the thought of a monster injecting you with worms is something I find incredibly unsettling. Next on our list of nasty things from Fear and Hunger, Blood Golems. These skinless blood golems can be summoned for a fight as they rise out of a pool of blood. They are extremely useful and tend to be great for endgame bosses that leave you with only three party members, such as going up against the God of Fear and Hunger or Grogoroth if you had Nasra in your party. Extremely powerful with double the regular HP of a character and high attack considering that they are unarmed. They are a brick of hardened skinless muscle that seems to be constantly bleeding. They are great tanks. It's a frequent strategy to summon a blood golem and then use pheromones on him to make him the party's tank and draw aggro, which puts his 200 HP to great use. Blood golems only last one fight, unlike skeletons and ghouls, and will dissipate after the fight is over. They are intrinsically nasty if for no other reason that they don't seem to have any skin, and they are magically born out of a puddle of blood. The Uterus Monster An Yet another great example of the use of body horror in Fear and Hunger. The uterus is really two enemies in one, with one being the mannequin that has sharp claws that can inflict the infection status effect and apply damage, and the other being the tanky carob. The uterus is, is another failed experiment of Altair, the enlightened one, as he continues to try to find a way to create artificial life. During the fight, the carob will drop out of the uterus's, well, its uterus, and start to crawl and stand up. The Carob will take the next few turns crawling up to the player's party and once close enough will start attacking. If you are able to apply DPS fast enough, it's possible to kill the Carob before he is able to attack. Being able to birth another enemy during a fight makes the Uterus a standout among the monsters in this game. The purple organ bags that you have to cut to get to the gauntlet. So this one's kind of easy yet difficult to describe. Throughout the dungeon, you will find three big purple pulsating wet bags of organs that need to be cut open to get access to the final endgame area, the gauntlet. Cutting open all three of them will grant the player access to the gauntlet where the traces of Grogoroth or the God of Fear and Hunger can be found. The player will know if they have cut them all open because they will receive a message that the gigantic organic mass around it has stopped pulsating after cutting the last one. I think we can easily say that one of the nastier things in the Dungeon of Fear and Hunger are these massive fleshy bags of nondescript organs. And the last one for today's video, the God of Fear and Hunger. The God of Fear and Hunger is considered to be one of the true final bosses, at least narratively. Although there are other bosses that might be more difficult or tougher, the God of Fear and Hunger wraps up the story. This is a unique boss fight. First, you have to escort the girl to the bottom of the dungeon and through the gauntlet, all the while she's taking up a slot in your party. If you reach the mound of bodies at the very end of the game, you will trigger her transformation into the god of fear and hunger that ushers in the cruel era. And this will trigger the final boss fight needed to get ending A. Here we have a five stage boss fight, as we will see the little girl gradually evolve into her final form. Each transformation seemed painful and the in-game text describing how cold the little girl feels. Each stage being more monstrous and disturbing than the previous, little by little becoming more of a distorted female figure, culminating in her true final form of the god of fear and hunger. In her final form, she will only execute self-mutilation attacks, as she needs to harness the pain. After a few self-mutilation actions, she will use her gaze upon the party, which is possible to instill such horror as to instantly kill the party 
if the coin flip has failed. And with that, I'm wrapping up this list of 20 nasty things found in the dungeon of fear and hunger. Let me know in the comments what got to you in fear and hunger that I missed out on this list. And let me know if you'd like to see another one of these videos. I still have plenty more on my list and there's still fear and hunger to turn up to do. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you'd like to support my work in the channel. Thank you very much. Take care and later.